crucial to Russell's considered account of the logical form of these propositions is the distinction between a propositional function and a proposition. A proposition is complete, it has a determinate meaning, every element has a well-determined meaning. On the other hand, a propositional function is not yet a complete proposition, it'll become a complete proposition once we determine the indeterminate elements of it. So, here's an example of a propositional function. X is human. Now, X doesn't stand for anything in particular in the context of this proposition. We don't know what X means, and we can't determine the truth value of this proposition because it's gonna change depending on what we put in for X. If we put in spot for X, then we get false because spot is a dog. If we put in prof banic for X, then we get false again because I'm an alien. No, if we put prof banic in for X, then we get um, prof banic is human and that comes out true. So this is a propositional function. We put an object in for X, and then we get a fully formed proposition. So we have a domain of things. Let's say these are all the things in the universe. We, a propositional function is something that allows us to take one of these objects, put it into the propositional function, and then out comes a fully fledged proposition with a determinate truth value. So propositional functions are functions from the domain of objects to a proposition. Now, one way to go from a propositional function to a proposition is as we just did, to take one of the particular objects in our domain, plug it in, and out comes a specific proposition referring to a, space, a specific object in the domain. But that's not the only way. What if we want to say something about how this propositional function behaves in the case of every object in the domain. Well, that's gonna be a different thing. We don't go in and plug each object one by one. Rather, we attach what's called a universal quantifier. We say for all X, X is human. Now this for us today is very commonplace, but Russell is still at the forefront of the invention of this logical machinery. And he, he has a very distinctive interpretation of what this universal quantifier means. For him, it's, it's a, a higher order property, a property not of objects, but of propositional functions, of linguistic items. So when we put this universal quantifier in front of our propositional function, what we get is this, that the propositional function X is human is always true. What we're saying is no matter which of these objects you wanna put in to the propositional function, it's always gonna come out true. Now that move is gonna be a very important because by using these quantificational devices, Russell is gonna show us a way to get rid of the denoting phrases and instead put in quantifiers. Another very important quantificational phrase, another way to finish out a propositional function and turn it into a full-fledged proposition is the existential quantifier According to an existential quantifier, we today read this as there is an X such that X is human. That means there's at least one thing that's human. So for, for Russell, once again, what we've done here is made a statement about the behavior of this propositional function. We've said, if you go through the entire domain, at some point, one of these things, when you put it in, will make it come out true. So there is something that's a human means for Russell, X is human is a propositional function that is sometimes true. Let's put this logical machinery to work in order to detect the true underlying logical form of negative existentials. Remember our first example, there are no flying horses. Russell would uncover the true logical form of this proposition in the following steps. We can restate number one in, this, that in a way that's equivalent logically by saying everything in the world is such that either it doesn't fly or it's not a horse. Pick anything you want. Either it doesn't fly or it's not a horse. If you give me something that's a horse, well, then it doesn't fly. If you give me something that doesn't fly, well, it might be a horse, but it might be a lot of other things as well. Point is, 
one prime is logically equivalent, has the same truth conditions as number one. And of course, this word everything, as we saw earlier for Russell, doesn't denote anything. It can be rephrased in the following way. X doesn't fly. Here we have a propositional function. X doesn't fly or X is not a horse. And what one prime is saying is that that propositional function is always true. Go to any object in the domain to plug it in for X and you're going to get a true proposition without fail. Now all we've done is we haven't denoted anything in the world. Notice nothing in one prime prime is in the business of denoting any particular object. We simply have logical vocabulary like negation and we have properties like flying or is a horse. None of those are the kinds of denoting phrases that Russell is concerned about. Nowhere here have we referred to anything that is a flying horse and said it has the property of non-existence. That's simply not what's going on in the logic of this statement. So far, so good, but things get trickier yet. Notice in the first example, what we are doing is saying that things of a particular kind don't exist. But what if we wanna say of a particular entity that it doesn't exist, such as if we wanted to say the creature from the Black Lagoon doesn't exist, the present King of France doesn't exist. Indeed, the Holy Grail doesn't exist. The Fountain of Youth doesn't exist. This word the for Russell is very, very perplexing in this context because the Holy Grail implies that it's the one and only Holy Grail. It's unique in that sense. So the previous analysis isn't going to do the trick. And then you might wonder, how could we do the trick? If V refers to a unique entity, then how can we capture that without actually being committed to the existence of the unique entity that we're trying to refer to with the word the? Indeed, this is the problem of definite descriptions that Russell brought to the forefront of philosophy of language. A definite description is when we use some term or predicate to describe one particular thing, not just any old thing, but the F is G. So the Holy Grail is golden, right? The F is G. That's the form of a definite description, but Russell thinks there's a much more complex logical form underlying this simple grammatical form. It's not mere subject predicate. There's something else much deeper going on there. To find the logical form of a statement, we need to find its truth conditions. That is, what are the conditions that would make the statement true? That's what the statement logically is. Russell thinks he finds three conditions on the truth of a definite description statement, such as the F is G, the Holy Grail is golden in our example. First is the existence condition. One thing you're positing when you say the Holy Grail is golden, is that there is a holy grail. In Russell's terminology, this is an existential quantifier. The propositional function, x is the holy grail, is sometimes true. If we go through the domain of objects and pick one out and plug it in for x, at some point we'll come upon the object of which it's true to say that it is the holy grail. But that's not enough. That says that at least one. But if there were two or three or four or five, one would, uh, would be true as well. So we need to build in a uniqueness claim, the Holy Grail, the one and only Holy Grail. Russell's way of thinking about that is to take this propositional function. If X and Y are the Holy Grail, then X equals Y. That is to say, if, if we have purportedly two things that are both the Holy Grail, well, then it must turn out that those two things were actually identical, one and the same thing, X equals Y. Finally, the G clause, we take the propositional function, if X is the holy grail, then X is golden, is always true. Now, Russell thinks he's found the three truth conditions that are required for phrases of the form, the F is G. We now set our gaze upon the logical form of a definite description. There is something that's F, and for anything else, if that thing was F, well, then it turns out to be the same thing as the first thing. So 
there is only one F. There is an F. There's only one F. And the, that same thing is also G. There is a Holy Grail. There's only one Holy Grail, and it's golden. That's the logical form of the definite description according to Russell. Now, if you don't understand all the logical notation, that's not the point. The point is that Russell believes he has taken out all of the denoting phrases in this. So when we want to turn to a, a negative existential, like the Holy Grail doesn't exist, nowhere are we having to denote a thing called the Holy Grail and predicate a property of it. That's simply not what is happening logically in this logical form. None of what you see before you denotes an object. Rather, what we have is logical notation, like quantification. We have the property of being F, and we have the property of being G. So if we want to say the the object of the definite description, the Holy Grail in this case, doesn't exist, all we need to do is take this nice, big, long, logical phrase and put a a negation in front of it. It's not the case that. We've now done some ontology through the logic and language. We no longer feel the pressure by our language to posit beings in the ontology that don't exist. Nothing in this phrase pressures us into doing that. We can make sense of a statement like, there is no Holy Grail, the Holy Grail doesn't exist, simply by thinking about which propositions are true and false which properties are instantiated and which are not. Nowhere do we need to make reference to a holy grail and then predicate of it the property of not existing. Our final negative existential was when we want to name, use the name of an entity like Thor and say Thor does not exist. A similar sentence would be something like Santa Claus does not exist, Harry Potter does not exist, and so on. Now, it's a name seems like it names something directly, but Russell wants to ask, how do names work? Whenever we use a name, Russell thinks, we've got in mind a description. So when I say the name Aristotle, for example, the way I'm referring to the person Aristotle is that I've got some description that the word Aristotle encodes, say the philosopher from ancient Greece who wrote Nicomachean Ethics. So every name is a disguised definite description. That means when we wanna go and do a negative existential like number three, Thor does not exist, really what we're doing is replacing the name Thor with a definite description Names are disguised definite descriptions. That's Russell's distinctive theory of names. Later on in the tradition of analytic philosophy, that idea will be vigorously contested, but that's for another day. Notice the big picture purpose of the point about names is that Russell is deploying his distinction between the grammatical form of a sentence, the way it appears to be structured in our average everyday language, on the one hand, and its true underlying logical form on the other. A sentence like Thor does not exist is more complicated than you thought it was in its logical form. This word Thor encodes a whole definite description. And once again, we've reduced all of the denoting phrases out of this sentence, and we are able to avoid Meinong's jungle.